Anita. Thank you, uh, Sandy. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me on to give the pandemic update. Um, as of uh, yesterday, uh, there are over 5.6 million people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and nearly 346,000 deaths worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., there are over 1.7 million infections and more than 101,000 deaths. Uh, to put this in perspective, uh, in three months, uh, COVID-19 has killed more Americans than in any wars except World War I, II, and the Civil War. The CDC is actually reporting a forecast that we will have about 115,000 deaths by June 20th, which is approximately the number of Americans who died in World War I. The 1.7 million documented infection in the United States may actually just be the tip of the iceberg as we're getting more studies uh, of testing. Uh, in a study of one cruise ship uh, with complete testing of 217 passengers and crew members, out of the 128 who were positive, 81% had no symptoms. Uh, in a skilled nursing facilities, at the time that they were tested, 56% of those who tested positive had no symptoms. And then in another study done by my colleagues at UCSF in the Mission District of San Francisco, 53% of the people who tested positive did not have symptoms. Since most testing at this time are being done on people who present to the healthcare system, presumably with symptoms, it's not unreasonable to conclude that there are hundreds of thousands of infections that have not been documented. One additional item from the UCSF study, even though Latinx uh, community members comprise only 44% of that sample that were tested, they made up 95% of those who were infected. And among those people who, were te who tested positive, 90% uh, of those reported that they could not work from home, were mostly low income, and live in household with three or more people. So these findings support the concern that low wage essential workers are at the high risk for getting COVID-19. There are no new major developments in the treatment or vaccine front. Uh, there is a report that after Gilead Sciences, uh, the pharmaceutical that uh, has been uh, testing remdesivir, uh, they donated 607,000 doses of that drug to the U.S. government to distribute to hospitals. Uh, the report says that the federal government mishandled that distribution, and most likely many patients who needed it had a delay in receiving it. Um, and I will want to close with some concerns about reopening uh, based on the data. So for the week ending May 24th, 20 states actually saw an increase in the number of new cases up from 13 states the week before. One of the first states to reopen, Georgia, reported a 21% increase in the number of cases in the week that ended on May 24th. Two weeks after the Wisconsin Supreme Court struck down the stay-at-home order, uh, put out by the uh, governor on May 28th, the state recorded its highest daily number of infections and deaths. This morning, the report out of South Korea, which has actually done a great job of limiting the pandemic, uh, which had, and which had reopened the schools with attendance limits, uh, they just shut down 500 schools because of a spike in the number of infections. And the situation in South Korea should worry us because they are much better than us at testing contact Training. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, Koreans are better at adhering to social policies like social distancing and mask wearing than we are. And they are also making data-based decisions. And as I stated the last time, our federal and some state governments are making decisions not always using the data, but also they are changing the data to make them fit their decisions. Already, we are seeing that one third of the states are not rep reporting COVID hospitalization data, which is a very significant marker of an increasing pandemic. And if they're not reporting it, we're not going to know when the time comes to, after we reopen, to close again or go back to some other state. Uh, the governor of Iowa has stated that the government will not report pandemic data from meatpacking plants on their data website. The District of Columbia does not meet its own criteria of having two weeks of decreasing number of infections before reopening. So instead of deciding not to reopen, they are now excluding infections from nursing homes, homeless shelters, and jails from their overall number. 
uh, which makes it seem like an effort to change the data to fit the reopening decision. Um, I did, uh, I did forget to mention that there were a, uh, and this was actually pretty highly publicized, uh, a model analysis from Columbia University researcher who basically said that if we had actually, as a whole, as a country, made the decision to go to shelter in place one week earlier than we did, 36,000 fewer Americans would have died from the COVID pandemic so far. Um, the way things are going, I am sure that there will be a second wave and almost sure that it will be a significant second wave. And I think we will look back and mourn the terrible decision that will kill thousands needlessly once again. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. Um, are there others who have a question for Dr. Wen? I, I have a question, Sunita. Uh, Dr. Nguyen, I, what did South Korea do wrong? Can you just zero in a little more on what we should learn from what's happening in South Korea? Um, yeah, thank you for unmuting me. Um, yeah, I actually don't think they did anything wrong, and that's what's so scary. Uh, I think when they reopened the schools, they didn't let everybody back. They they kept some guidelines, as far as I could tell. They didn't have full attendance. Um, maybe I think I saw a number of 75% attendance. Um, and so what it's telling us is this infection is just incredibly, this uh, COVID is incredibly infectious. Uh, and it, as long as it remains in the community somewhere, somehow, it will spread when we give the opportunity to do so. Doctor, thank you for your wonderful presentation once again this morning. And my question is, um, in regards to the states, with so many states not reporting and uh, we know that the cases are increasing, what is going to be the worst case scenario for uh, the people that are going to be impacted for the nation? I mean, is there anything that can be done to uh, mitigate what's coming? Uh, well, so, so I think there's a couple of questions in there. You know, the worst case scenario is um, hopefully we won't be as bad as we were in the first wave, because at least we will have know some of the things we have to do um, to uh, address the problems that our healthcare system is slightly better off now than it was three month, two months or three months ago. Um, and hopefully that that our decision makers are able to make a more rapid decision when they see things going in the wrong direction. I think in terms of what we can do to mitigate mitigate that, I think uh, I think what you're doing is very important, which is reporting on the fact that the data is being changed uh, to fit policy so that community members uh, and community organizations and, and people in general can advocate to their local go uh, government to report better data. Uh, and I also think that, you know, there is a tension here about reopening with the e economics of the whole thing. Uh, I, I just have to say that I'm not convinced that the economy is going to be helped if we reopen too early and, and more people will die. One more question, and that is from Peter White. Peter, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, you can hear me? Yes. I, I just, um, you know, we've done so much reporting on this and I'm still not clear after all this time. Wh why is it that that either our, the human side of this evidence or the biological side of the virus has this second wave? You know, that there's going to be a second surge. I mean, what, what's can, can can you explain how that happens? Is that whether it's, you know. Yeah, that's that's simple science and biology. The virus is very infectious. So if you have it and you touch someone or you again come in contact with someone else, they're going to get it. So as long as there's some virus out there and we're in contact with people, it's going to spread. Uh, and that's the reason why it was so important that we all got you know, uh, stay at home orders. Uh, and that's why things have gotten better. Now the decision to reopen has always been, you know, scientifically based on the idea that number one, that we can lower the number of infections so that that potential exposure is less. There's a probability of you coming in or us coming into contact with anyone who's infected is a lot lower. And then the second problem, you know, thing is that of course, if we do our best, to minimize uh, transmission, whether it's social distancing or wearing a mask or washing our hands, that the probability of getting that spread is even more. But I don't think the numbers really support, and this just changes from state to state. I don't wanna make a 
blanket statement about every state, but I think a lot of the states don't have the lower number of infections that will allow us to not have a second wave or a significant second wave. Dr. Wen, thank you so much for your weekly up, uh, updates. It's enormously useful to our reporters. Appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is Charles Phillips. He's the uh, director on the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Um, and he's going to talk about the factors that left um, ethnic uh, businesses out of the first round of stimulus funding and uh, factors that have historically left uh, uh, minorities out of uh, getting access to funding. Uh, Mr. Phillips, are you here? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Great. Great. Happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'll just give you a quick summary of kind of what the Fed has been working on the PPP program and the constraints and the issues that we're facing getting money to smaller, smaller companies. Um, so, first of all, the Fed has a number of facilities for businesses, something like nine different programs for big and small companies. So most of them are for large companies, things like commercial paper market, uh, primary corporate facilities, uh, and uh, the volume is just unprecedented. So to give you an idea, during the 2009 crisis, uh, it was not unusual for the Fed to do four auctions a day, which consider a lot. Usually there may be one a day. And now they're doing 15 a day and they're doing it all remotely from home. And so they had to stand up, you know, this large program pretty quickly. And that stabilized the credit markets, which was important for the broader economy to happen. Because remember, about 52 percent of employees uh, in the country work for larger companies and the other 48 percent work for small companies. So you had to do both. So they did a good job on the large companies. Um, so moving on from there, though, what happened was uh, the smaller uh, companies aren't serviced by normal banks that you think of, the JP Morgan or Bank of America. There's a separate financial infrastructure for them, and those organizations are called Community Development Financial Institutions, or CDFIs. And what those are are basically non-bank banks. They're organizations set up explicitly to serve minority and underserved communities. So they're funded that way. They are targeted. They're much smaller. And those banks know those communities well, but that's the whole reason they exist is that they raise capital. Sometimes they're nonprofits, sometimes they're banks, usually not. Uh, sometimes they raise capital from the, the open market, but that's their strategy. So you know that if you invest in one of those CDFIs, there's about 1,100 of them across the country. In the first round of funding, only about 90 of them participated in the PPP program. The reason for that is most of them were not a part of the uh, SBA, the Small Business Administration,